welcome friends and colleagues to the Center for Asian Health Research and Education monthly community health talks. Today, we'll be discussing what it means to be Asian in America from missing data to misrepresentation. I'm Dr. Malathi Srinivasan, Associate Director for Stanford Care and Director of the Stanford Care Scholars and Team Science Fellowship Programs. Now, before we get started, a few announcements. Our event today is sponsored by the Stanford Center for Asian Health Research and Education in partnership with the Stanford Asian Staff Forum and the Asian American Journalists Association in San Francisco. We also invite you to subscribe to the Stanford Care mailing list to receive notifications of upcoming events, such as our in-language health talks and broad topics, such as Dr. Lava Palaniathan's panel discussion this Thursday uh, at the Asia at 2030 conference at the Shorenstein Center on the Stanford campus. We also invite you to follow us on social media. Nina, uh, on this call, will put links into chat so that you can do so. Now, today, we are so lucky to have Ryan Yamamoto moderating our discussion, What It Means to Be Asian in America. Ryan is a friend and colleague who is a five-time Emmy Award winner, a news anchor reporter, and documentary filmmaker whose career has stretched more than 25 years. Ryan grew up in the East Bay, and his journalism in journey has taken him all across the country, and he's now our anchor at CBS in San Francisco. At KPIX, he's extensively covered issues regarding the Appy community, such as how our San Francisco Chinatown is rising up against violence in their community. He's also examined the history of hate in America by following his own family's journey through the Japanese internment camp experience. So Ryan, uh, please let me turn the conference over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, doctor, and for the introduction. As, as she had mentioned, my name is Ryan Yamamoto. I'm one of the main anchors and reporters at KPIX CBS News Bay Area. Uh, I've been very fortunate in my career that it's taken me all across the United States, getting to experience how different parts of the country think and react about culture and ethnicity. And during my places and during my journey in many places, you know, a lot of times I was the only person who looked like me or had a strange foreign sounding name in that newsroom. And, and maybe I was a little naive, but I was also feel like I was very lucky that through most of my experience, it was positive. Most of my coworkers accepted me, most of our viewers accepted me, no matter where I was in, in, in the country. And, and I do say most because there is one experience that still sticks with me today that happened very early in my career, not here in San Francisco or Seattle or Sacramento. I, I won't mention the station and I won't mention names, but one day I was walking out of a studio and then my assignment manager then pulled me aside and said, Ryan, you're gonna have a great future in this business, but you need to work on your accent. And so I was young, I was naive. I didn't really know what he meant. So I was thoroughly confused. But thought maybe he meant, OK, maybe he needs I need to enunciate more or, or maybe I was speaking with some kind of California. Hey, dude, accent uh, that I needed to drop. So I asked him, what, what do you mean that uh, my accent? He says, yeah, well, you know, your your accent, your accent. And this kind of went back and forth for a little bit. And finally, it, it hit me what he meant. So I asked, do you mean do I have an Asian accent? And he would never say that, but he went back and forth. He said, well, yeah, you need to work on that. And we went back and forth as I got really upset about this. And finally, I, I asked him, I said, well, how do you think I have an Asian accent, a, a, a Japanese accent when I don't even speak Japanese? My, my parents don't even speak Japanese. I never even learned the language. It was never spoken in my household. And we continued to go back and forth. And finally, I, you know, I just I yelled at him and, and I stormed off and, and that was the, the end of that. And, and when I look at back at that conversation, what he didn't know and I wish I could explain to him back then, and if I can go back and, and talk to him, was that the Japanese language was lost for many families during World War II. After 120,000 Japanese Americans were rounded up on the West Coast and sent to internment camps, at least in my father's family, he was told by my grandmother to never speak Japanese, to only speak English, because she was so afraid what would happen if they were caught uttering a single word of Japanese in public. And, and I do know for most Asian American groups, 
the tradition of language goes and, and does fade over generations. But for, for Japanese Americans, this is our story. The Japanese language was cut off between the Issei and the Nisei, the first generation and the second generation. So most Sansei, like me, third generation, Yonsei, fourth generation, we don't speak Japanese. The language was lost within this Asian American culture. But this is just my experience. But today we're here to talk about our experience as a whole. We're here to ask the question, what does it mean to be Asian America, Asian, um, Asian in America, from missing data to misrepresentation? There's, there's no easy answer to that question because being Asian can mean so many different things to so many different people. But to help to gain a better understanding, we are joined by an esteemed panel of experts. So let me introduce them. So first, I'd like to introduce Neil Ruiz, Associate Director of Race and Ethnic Research with the Pew Research Center. Also joining us, Dr. Russell Zhang, Professor of Asian American Studies at San Francisco State University, go Gators, and co-founder of Stop AAPI Hate. Dr. Richard Pan, a pediatrician and former California State Senator and chair of the California Asian American and Pacific Islander Legislative Caucus, also a member of the California State Assembly. And Dr. Mafia Sirianvasa, Associate Director at Stanford Center for Asian Healthcare Research and Education, and also an expert and contributor to KPIX CBS News Bay Area's Medical Monday. So thank you everyone for joining us. But to begin our discussion, let's start with recent research, recent data on the shared experiences that shape Asian American identities. That study was literally released by Pew Research Center a week and one day ago. And one of the people working on that study, of course, is Neil Ruiz. So Neil, we'll begin with you as we look into and dive into this question. When did your research actually begin? And more importantly, what did you find? Well, thank you so much, Ryan, for having me. Um, and we started this, this is a multi-year effort uh, because Asian Americans are 24 million people in the United States, which is 7% of, of the US population. Because we're a small proportion, it's hard to do research like in terms of survey, but it took many years and, and a lot of partners. So I'll present quickly what we did and I'm, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, but just a little bit, as I mentioned, we had a lot of partners because tradition to do this type of study, we had to get partners from various sectors throughout the United States. So we're just so proud that we were able to partner with many of these groups. But first, this survey released a week, eight days ago. This is the largest survey ever done on Asian Americans that is nationally represented. We sent out 268,000 invitations with $2 bills to addresses all over the US to yield 7,006 Asian Americans. And we did it with paper and web because I know that my parents, like they're older in their 80s, they would never answer a questionnaire in, 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 a, web, in a web. So to make sure that we really represent all Asian Americans in the US. Um, and it was conducted in five languages as well as in English. So what did we find? There's a diversity of Asian identities in the US. Um, so we asked this question about your, how do you describe yourself most often? Your ethnicity, such as Korean or Filipino or Vietnamese, your ethnicity with American, so like Filipino American, Vietnamese American, Asian American, Asian alone, American alone, or regional Asian, like South Asian or Southeast Asian. What we found was that Asian adults like to describe just over half use ethnicity, whether alone like Filipino or in combination like Japanese American. What we also found is that just over half also use American in combination or alone to describe their identity. But what's interesting here, in media and journalists, we use this all the time to talk about Asian Americans or Asian, just 28% use Asian or Asian American to describe themselves most often. Let's take a little deeper dive on these identities. So you can see that place of birth, what we found, shapes Asian American identities. So this is a look at foreign-born results. The majority of those who were immigrants, those Im um, immigrated to the US, describe themselves with their ethnicity. Um, 
whereas those who are um, here were less so on American and also a lot less on Asian. But those who were born in the United States, less so in terms of their ethnicity, but more so using American in some form or another. So this is also interesting how place of birth shapes our life in America. So those who were born abroad who are immigrants more likely will have most or all of their friends who are the same ethnicity as them or who are otherwise Asian. They also don't consider themselves when we ask, are you a typical American? So less, 37% only say so. And 15% have hidden a part of their culture from non-Asian people. But the US born, Asian American, those who were born in the US are less likely to have friends who are the same ethnicity or Asian are more likely to consider themselves a typical American, but also have hidden a part of their culture while they were growing up in the US. I know this because I know as a Filipino American growing up in, Cal in Ventura County, I used to hide, told my parents to make, not make me bring a chicken adobo, which is a Filipino dish, because I was made fun of. And we asked an open-ended question, and people were saying embarrassed, tease, made fun of. So now I know that I wasn't alone. I know there's many others experiencing that same experience. So among Asian immigrants, um, they're less likely, they're more likely, again, those who immigrated most recently use their ethnic identity, whereas those who've been here longer are more likely to adopt the American into their identity. When it comes to those, again, long-term residents, so even if you're an immigrant, the longer you're here, the more likely your friends are less likely to be the same ethnicity or Asian, and the more likely you're considering yourself a typical American. And this is just a question we ask, do Asians in the US have many different cultures or share a common culture? Asian adults are saying, vast majority, 9% of us have different cultures, which is not too far off. The general US public is also not too far off. But what is shared? I talked about this diversity by immigration generations where you're born. Well, there are many shared experiences among Asian Americans as well. Most of us um, say that 60%, about 60% say what happens to other Asians in the US impacts our own lives, at least some of the time. We're also called for a national leader to advance the US Asian American interests and concerns. 70% of us say that. And also, when we walk along the street, even we have these identities using our ethnic labels, people usually just describe us, 60% say people would describe us as simply Asian. So when it comes to history, we're talking here, this is API Heritage Month. We had a question to Asian Americans, how informed are you of the history of Asians in the US? Only 24% of Asians say they're extremely or very informed of history of Asians in the US. And of them, among those who say they extremely are very informed, they're learning it through informal ways, like the internet or media, not through schools, such as elementary, through high school, or even college. So I talked about these differences, the shared experiences of Asians, but at the end of the day, what does it mean to be American for Asian Americans? Well, we know there's a myth. There's a myth out there that we're forever foreigners. Well, we have the data to show we're no different. On these values, we asked Asian adults um, and US adults in a separate survey, they're nearly identical when it comes to accepting people of diverse racial and religious backgrounds, nearly identical on believing in individual freedoms, nearly identical on respecting US political institutions and laws. So Asian Americans are no different from Americans in terms of our values. So the survey does, it, because it's so large, we have deep dives of the big, the largest six Asian origin groups. So you can see, you can read the report, you can go deep, dive deep between Filipinos, Japanese, Korean adults, and also what, what they're more likely to say. So I just want to end there, um, but I'm just so privileged and honored that, you know, it took a lot of work to do this, but it's so important because now the reactions from hearing people that they say that finally heard and they could see themselves in our data. And that means a lot to me and to this Pew Research Center. Thank you. And, and Neil, that data is so important and so extraordinary. I know that's just like a, a small sampling of, of what Pew Research did, but my question 
I wanted to ask you, you know, the Asian cultures are, are so diverse. There's so many of them. You talked about the big six, uh, but my experience versus someone who might be Chinese American, who might be Filipino American, who might be Indian, their experiences are different from mine. Why does the government just lump us into one group though? Well, there's a long, there's a history. There was actually a long history. We even put in our report about, you know, Asians used to be excluded <laughs> from being even citizens of the U.S., at a time um, in the mid 19th century. But I think it's it's also a byproduct of the census of what's cho chosen in terms of the uh, office of management budget on, on the category said. Asian is a very geographic, if you think about it, a geographic category compared to Hispanics, which is more on language, white and black, which is based on the color of her skin. So very interesting to see you know, how Asians were, were based on a geographic mm -hmm. identity. <clears throat> Any any big surprises from the numbers? I think um, I don't know if you see one major surprise. No big surprises, but I think um, finally there are numbers behind it. Like I didn't expect us to be. I, I did expect based on my own experience about being very American, but now that we have a near identical, that's that's really that just really shows that if people treat Asian Americans as forever foreigners or thinking that you're different. There's many, many Asian Americans in the U.S. actually have identical values with the general public. Well, thank you very much, Neil. And, and we can talk more about this. And for people who are watching or participating in this, uh, you can go to the question and answer area if you want to ask a question directly to Neil or into the uh, webinar chat. And we'll try to answer as many questions that you might have. But moving on, much of the recent research on Asian Americans began as we started to see that rise in AAPI hate. And I talk about recent research. So let's bring in Russell Jung. Uh, professor and doctor of Asian American studies and co-founder of Stop AAPI Hate. Russell, there's there's a long history of discrimination in this country against Asian Americans. How does that history play into the prejudice, the racism, and the rise in attacks that Asian Americans are now facing today? Thanks for that question, Ryan. And I'd like to thank uh, Stanford Cares for hosting us today and for um for Neil's presentation and the Pew Research important data on um, Asian Americans. You know, the question about how history affects us is, is really significant because history clearly repeats itself. Um, we knew um, when COVID-19 was coming that Asians would get blamed for the disease, would get scapegoated and face racism in both interpersonally and in terms of policy. And that's why we created Stop AAPI Hate. And so history is really significant because um, it forms the foundation of how Asians have been treated. And because it's created structures and institutions that treat us similarly as Asians, even though we're such a diverse community, as you noted, um, we're facing similar treatment and we're facing similar um, discrimination. So I'd, I'd like to share quickly um, the ways we have faced similar histories and how I'm sort of concerned that history may repeat itself today. Um, so what I want to talk about, um, you know, we um, Neil shared some of the data, how Asians are just like other Americans in our beliefs. But another data point is that even though Asian Americans are like other Americans in our beliefs and wanting to belong to America, we're the racial group that feels the least sense of belonging in the US and um, among all racial groups. And um, from the launch survey data, um, the status index, they found that because of racial discrimination and because of the lack of representation, Asians are made to feel like they don't belong. And so it's not that we are different or we hold different values, it's that discrimination is really shaping us. And historically, we have been shaped by this stereotype that Asians are the yellow peril, um, we're the dusky peril to be avoided. This stereotype is the idea that Asians um, will come from the East and invade the West, and we threaten the very existence of the West. Um, in Europe, they were long afraid of Asians, you know, with Genghis Khan and the Mongols, but Kaiser Wilhelm in the 19th century actually had a nightmare. And he, um, his fear was that ja Japan would rise from the East and overcome the West. And so he actually made this lithograph of his nightmare and sent it to every ruler in Europe. 
to the king of England, to the um, ruler of Prussia. And he warned of this peril of Japan's ascendance, and he called for Christendom to unite or else um, they would you know, fall to Asia. And so this fear of Asians um, has continued to this day and is prim the primary stereotype, I think, that's shaping us. And it's shaped not only people's perceptions, but it's actually shaped policies. So here you can see <clears throat> um, representations from the 19th century. The diseases of malaria, smallpox, and leprosy were specters of death emanating out of San Francisco Chinatown. And because people were afraid that Chinese would bring their diseases, that Chinese as pagans would bring their immorality, and that Chinese would steal white workers' jobs, Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act. So the yellow peril got translated into the first piece of legislation to bar an entire ethnic group. <clears throat> that exclusion of Asians didn't quell violence. Instead, both South Asians, Chinese, Japanese following them, Koreans, Filipinos, we were all seen as the peril invading the nation. And <clears throat> the exclusion laws then sanctioned further violence, mob violence against Asians. So in 1906 in Bellington, Washington, over 200 um, South Asians were driven out of Washington. And this photograph um, is from Monterey, California, where my great grandparents settled. They lived there for four decades, raised a family, um, had a thriving business. But because of racism, a fire burned down the entire village. And this is the aftermath of that fire. Um, the report said that onlookers cheered while um, others um, looted and pillaged the, um, the remains. And so my great-grandparents were mass dispossessed, displaced, and had to move to San Francisco Chinatown as the only place of refuge from the racism. This yellow peril fear of Asians being um, disease-ridden continued on Angel Island. On Ellis Island, European migrants were um, processed and allowed to disembark in two to three hours. Asians, on the other hand, again, were mass detained under locked barracks with armed guards. And they had to go through lengthy interrogations and severe medical checks. 5% of the Asians were actually deported back for not meeting health standards, like, um, you know, for having hookworms. Um, again, the yellow peril strikes again um, during World War II. So again, Japanese were seen as the enemies within and they faced mass incarceration. As you said, Ryan, 120,000 Japanese Americans um, were incarcerated during that period, again, seen as threats to the nation's um, national security. More recently, again, the dusky peril of um, South Asians, the fear of South Asians was resurrected after 9-11 and during the war on terrorism. With the advent of Islamophobia, that got institutionalized in the Muslim ban and mass deportations of South Asians, Arabs, and Muslims. So you can see time and time again, Asians have faced violent exclusion, both institutionally and at an interpersonal level, because we're seen as forever foreigners, um, the perilous threats to America. And now today, most recently, again, because of COVID-19 and the use of the term Chinese virus, um, Chinese were seen as the disease carriers, and so there was a huge backlash against Chinese and those who look Chinese. And even though we're done with the pandemic, what I'm really concerned about is the rise of the, the U.S.-China antagonisms, that there's a U.S.-China Cold War, and we see, again, history repeating itself. There's been bans on land ownership by um, non-citizens, TikTok got banned. And currently, there's proposed legislation in this effort to outcompete China that requires every federal agency to have a point person to investigate um, um, misuse of um, or to scrutinize Chinese with relations to China. And so I'm really concerned that there be heightened racial profiling. And if there's any conflict with China, the backlash against Chinese and those who look Chinese will be um, severe. So to sum up, 
you know, this yellow peril, this dusky peril um, stereotype has been repeated in US history. It's repeated as recently as COVID-19. I'm really concerned that as we um, continue to antagonistic relations with China, it'll lead to the bashing of Chinese in the US and those who look like them. So sorry to end a really uh, doomsday note, but um, I look forward to the conversations on how we could temper the um, zero sum game of competition with China. Uh, Russell, thank you for your presentation. I had a quick question. <clears throat> Obviously, the, the discrimination has lasted for years and, and, and it's very historical. Uh, but looking at today, the rise in violence that we're seeing, is there more violence now than there was in the past? Uh, what are you seeing as far as the attacks, the physical and the violent attacks that are happening today? Um, well, it's clearly not as bad as the 19th century, you know, because back then, um, you know, Asians couldn't even testify in courts, so we could be attacked with impunity. But today, there is an increase in racism. And what's, you know, there's heightened awareness of anti-Asian violence against East Asians, but South Asians and Southeast Asians report even greater violence, um, even during COVID. And that's because of other factors like Islamophobia, because of class and colorism. So I would say, um, well, I know, according to um, other survey data, that one half of Asians in America feel unsafe today because of their race. So that's it's sort of the norm that we have a sense of fear that that's shaping where we go, um, where we want to live, who we hang out with. And so um, I think the racism is a pretty significant um, stressor on our communities at this moment. And I'm going to take one audience question real quick. So Dr. Jung, politicians on both sides of the aisle have characterized China as public enemy number one. How does that actually filter back to Chinese Americans? And, and I would actually add to that Asian Americans as a whole. All right, that's a great question. Um, there was a recent Princeton study that says that people who think that China is the greatest threat to the US also then have negative stereotypic views about Chinese people as immoral and trustworthy. And that these people also homogenize Asians so that they can't distinguish between Chinese in China and Chinese in the US. They also can't distinguish between Chinese in the US and other Asians. So there is a correlation between criticizing China as a nation and the PRC's um, policies People conflate that with the Chinese people and then conflate Chinese people with Asians in the US. And what we need to do is decouple. I think it's okay to criticize the Chinese government and its policies, but I think we have to really affirm friendship um, with Chinese people and affirm the, the dignity and the rights of Asians in America. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Jung. Uh, we'll, we'll circle back with some more questions later on. Uh, but as we move this conversation forward, one of the important parts that we're also talking about is data misrepresentation. And Dr. Sirin Vasan, as we try to understand the complexities in our cultures of Asian Americans, without proper research, without proper data, do people in the AAPI communities, do they get misrepresented, especially when we're talking about the medical field and, and in healthcare? Yeah, Ryan, I'm so glad that we're talking about health and health care. Um, you know, I, and I wanted to thank the panelists for all of the great work that they've been doing. And the stories that you have personally told about discrimination really resonate with me as well. Uh, when I grew up in Chicago in um, a while ago, uh, it was a very blue collar, white collar experience. And um, being one of the few uh, Asians and South Asians in our community, uh, there was a lot of bullying, a lot of hate a lot of go back to your own country, dot head, camel head, um, uh, you know, camel jockey type of things. And it was a very uh, adverse external environment uh, while having a very rich personal family expatriate environment. And um, as I went through my training in medicine and also did a research fellowship in uh, health services research, uh, epidemiology and medical education, there were really no opportunities to study disparities amongst Asians. And um, uh, Stanford and other uh, major institutions now, Pew, et cetera, are now turning focus 
to Asian health and Asian health disparities. And you might ask, you know, where are Asians in American healthcare data? And why are we not better represented? Why are the problems that Asians are facing with diabetes and heart disease not really that recognized? And it's because of several factors. Um, it's omission, aggregation, and extrapolation, which are really affecting uh, the way American uh, Asian healthcare data is represented. And if it's okay, I'd like to spend a few minutes just talking about those things. Right. Um, so, uh, uh, so I think everyone knows where Asia is, but I wanted to go through a couple of terms because we're using them. So all of the, co the uh, uh, countries in color are part of Asia, whether it's North Asia or Central Asia or uh, West Asia, but South Asia is kind of in green. Um, uh, Central, um, uh, East Asia uh, is in yellow and Southeast Asia, which has uh, a lot of the higher economic disparities is in sort of this pink color. And what people might not uh, know is that 60% of the world's population is Asian. So in the circle, there's more people in the circle than outside of the circle in the world. And um, uh, in the US, one in seven people are Asian and uh, coming from, 80% uh, come from uh, six major groups, but there's a long tail at the end. Uh, so this doesn't include people who are from Cambodia or Indonesia. And in the Bay Area, one in three are Asian. Um, and you might say, well, you know, this is, an, and the population uh, has been increasing very rapidly uh, of Asians since uh, the, the early 2000s. Uh, but what you probably don't know, and one of the commentators put this in as a question, uh, I think for, um, for Neil at the beginning, is that only 0.17% uh, uh, of NIH funding actually goes towards Asian health research. And that's partly because the people who are making the funding decisions didn't have Asians at the table. And this is happening because of uh, implicit bias. Again, you know, uh, who's in the room really makes a difference on what gets done. And it's happening because of the extrapolation, aggregation, and omission. And I'm just gonna go over what I mean by those things. So extrapolation is where you take data from one group and apply it to lots of other groups inappropriately. So the classic example is that uh, back in the 60s, there was a study called the Nihon San study of cardiovascular mortality rates in Japanese men. And um, uh, they looked at Japanese men in Japan, in Honolulu, in mainland. So Nihon, which is Japan, Honolulu, and San Francisco. And uh, they compared that to people who were really, you know, kind of in the Boston area in Massachusetts from the Kit Framingham study, and found that people who were non-Hispanic white men had rates of cardiovascular deaths of about, you know, um, eight or 10 per 100,000, and that Japanese men uh, in Japan, Hawaii, and San Francisco had much less uh, rates of death. And so the conclusion was that every Asian everywhere, male or female, no matter where they live, no matter what year it was, had two to four times lower rates of cardiovascular deaths than, than uh, people who were white. And, um, uh, you know, that's clearly erroneous. Um, and let's kind of take a look a little bit about uh, how, why that happened. And it's because of aggregation. Okay. Aggregation is where you take all of the groups of people, put them into one big lump sum, and make generalizations about them. And when you disaggregate, you actually get uh, uh, better data. So if you look at all Asians, uh, looking at the same coronary artery disease issue, um, you can see that um, uh, you know Asians have uh, Asian men have about the same incidence of heart disease as non-Hispanic whites, whereas women are slightly less. But once you disaggregate, and these are the kind of disaggregated major six groups that we talked about earlier, um, uh, you can see that uh, people who are South Asian, uh, Asian Indian, have almost twice the risk of heart disease, uh, as do Filipinos and uh, Vietnamese, but people who are Korean or Japanese have slightly lower, and uh, Korean women have very low rates of heart disease overall. Um, the same types of things are true for diabetes, where uh, if you look overall, it looks like Asians are about twice as much having uh, diabetes as uh, people who are uh, uh, non-Hispanic white, but it's about you know three or four times for Asian uh, Indians and much more for people who are Filipino or for Korean. So the risks really vary based on lifestyle, on genetics, and a whole bunch of other things. And these are some other examples with cholesterol, um, and uh, even with income differences, uh, people think of the Indian um, uh, Asians as being model minorities, where our life is so terrific, and you know people are studying hard and doing really well. But by group, it's really different. So if you're looking at income differences of people with um, uh, uh, incomes who are uh, uh, below the federal, like within 200% of the federal poverty limit, you see that people who are Korean and Vietnamese and who are Chinese are more likely to be low income. 
uh, in comparison with non-Hispanic white overall. And similarly, it looks like overall Asians may have higher percentages of bachelor's degree, but if you're Cambodian or Hmong, that rate is very, very low, it's only 14%. Uh, similar things we'll find with smoking, um, by gender, with hypertension, and importantly, there's genetic differences where people metabolize different uh, medications differently. So for a medication like a cholesterol medication to bring down that cardiovascular risk, if you are uh, Chinese, uh, Japanese, or Korean, you need less of a dose for the same effect, um, whereas you might need a higher dose for people who are African American or who are Asian Indian. Um, and when people were giving a medication called Plavix, we were seeing excess bleeding with people who are South Asian and more uh, strokes and uh, cardiovascular events uh, like instant rethrombosis with people who were a uh, Korean uh, because of gain and loss of function mutations where there was a loss of function mutation for people who are Japanese, Korean, and Chinese and a gain of function mutation in people who were, uh, uh, who were South Asian. So, you know, it's really important when we're looking at data that not only are we collecting the data well, but we're able to disaggregate by group so that we can actually make group level more precise um, uh, estimates of health risks and target our interventions and our medications appropriately. And the last major issue has to do with omission, which is, you know, um, Asians have been undersampled in national studies, they haven't been participating in trials, and they haven't even been really recruited all that well. And um, uh, this is uh, kind of how the census has looked. And uh, you know, up until about a few years ago, we didn't really have good disaggregated census data. And similarly for the national uh, mortality databases, uh, until about 2006, um, we didn't have a standardized death certificate. So we didn't know what people were passing away from. Um, and, uh, uh, and in fact, even at Stanford, this is from a couple of years ago, uh, we had basically, of all the patients who we had, uh, most people, we didn't have any demographic information about them. And only 1% were identifying as Asian, but we know, you know, it's about uh, one in three, about 33% in, in the Bay Area. The national data sets are hard to access. They're expensive. And if you want disaggregated data because of low response rates, um, uh, it's really hard to get it. Uh, it can take years. And then similarly, again, although Asians are a large percentage of the U.S. population and globally, um, uh, globally, only 11% of Asians participate in clinical trials, and in the U.S., it's around 2%. So really, you know, to be able to go from health inequity to inequity requires systems level solutions. And, um, you know, we have to do better with collection and research analysis, um, and we have to really be very deliberate about how we go about collecting health data as the Pew Research Center has just done uh, with their wonderful, wonderful uh, study. So, you know, uh, Asians are very diverse. Uh, we need to kind of look at group level differences um, while at the same time doing uh, system level uh, advocacy to be able to change the way our, our policies are done and get people to participate in uh, studies and share that information that's so vital to be able to improve the health of the public. Oh, Ryan, I think you're on mute. Sorry about that, I apologize. Um, the, the, the information that you presented is very interesting. And you talked about uh, how Asian Americans are misrepresented in the data, but I wanna ask you a question that you, you kind of touched upon. Not only are they mis misrepresented, it's also access to that data. Why is it so hard to gain access to the data and what are the challenges that come with that? There's a lot of, there's several, but the first is that um, because the response rates are low, the, the national data sets, whether it's a national health interview survey or the national health and nutrition survey, their primary job is to protect the privacy, including the census, is to protect the privacy of the people who had answered uh, those questions. And if the cell size is low, if there's not enough people in a particular group, they suppress the data. And so depending on what your question is, if you're looking at something that's a lower frequency topic, it's very hard to get to. So um, uh, you have to have data use agreements. You've got to be a secret sworn officer uh, and go through like a two-year process to be able to get to the data. If you want things that are part of restricted data, not only do you have to go through an entire committee, which can take a couple of years, and by the time you're done, the question might be irrelevant, but then you have to actually have this special sworn officer go to an air gap computer at a federal data center and get the data. You can only run it once. It's, it's very complicated. And so there has to be a balance between ease of access of data, cost of getting the data, can cost up to $25,000 to answer a single question, 
and uh, then being able to balance that with patient privacy. So uh, there's ways of doing it. Other people share data sets very um, uh, safely with data use agreements, but um, uh, we, we we're collecting all this important information, but people who want to improve the public health can't get to it. You know, and I, I'd love to circle back with some more questions. Then there's some questions in, in, in the uh, question and answer. Hopefully we'll get to those uh, a little bit later on. Uh, but I did want to move on to Dr. Richard Pan. And doctor, as a former lawmaker and practicing pediatrician, I want to maybe put you on the spot for a little bit, but why, why are we now just starting to see more research and data on, on the AAPI populations? And why is that data so important, especially as a lawmaker or a former lawmaker, as when it comes to making policy? Well, thank you so very much, uh, Ryan, uh, for, for that question and for having me here. And I want to uh, thank, again, Stanford uh, Center for Asian Health and Research and Education for, for doing this very important event. Uh, I also want to mention that uh, you shared your personal story about why you don't speak Japanese. Well, uh, when I was growing up, uh, actually, uh, my parents were immigrants from Taiwan. Uh, they spoke Mandarin at home. I mainly spoke Mandarin when I started school, and they decided to put me in special education because I didn't learn English. I didn't know English that well, and so and told my parents that they should only have me speak English because uh, that the, the the Mandarin was interfering with my ability to speak English, and that I was probably not smart enough to be able to handle both. So uh, therefore, I don't speak Mandarin anymore. Uh, but anyway, so that's a not uncommon history. I'm not the only one I've heard that story from, and uh, that just again shows you uh, how we've been erased, uh, even as we've been uh, growing up in this country. Uh, data is important. Because uh, for policymakers, when you say, oh, we have a problem, right? So we have a problem with the Asian American community. Uh, we have a problem somewhere. They said, so prove it. Where's the data, right? And if the data doesn't exist, then the problem doesn't really exist, right? So that becomes a major issue when there isn't data available. Uh, it's hard to move large scale policy. I mean, it's, certainly we've had policy made by anecdote, uh, but uh, Data is important. In fact, that's why uh, it's part of the API equity budget, which the uh, California legislature passed. We actually invested in collecting more data. And so actually one of my roles right now is I'm uh, you know, senior policy advisor to API data. We're really looking at that demographic data. I really appreciate uh, Dr. Sinevonson's presentation about and discussion about how hard it is to get that data. But Actually, another problem is that sometimes that data isn't even collected in the first place. So uh, I know that uh, we've cited the paper that indicated that NIH only funds 0.17% uh, uh, of study. You know, their funding is focused on uh, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander populations. Uh, but I think another paper that's also important to cite is, is that because so, someone could say, oh, well, you know, but there's a lot of research that's done that includes a an HPI. Uh, but it's not focused on AA and HPI. And so someone actually did a study where they looked at the uh, top six major medical journals, since we're, you know, uh, we'll talk, focus on medicine since I'm a doctor. Uh, and uh, and they looked at the public and the articles that came out that were published, right, over two years. And they examined there were about a thousand articles that had uh, about human subjects, of course, because we're talking about people. And um, of, of those uh, of those papers, uh, so this uh, this by the way was just published in 2021. Uh, so they looked at papers in 2015 and 2016, and they identified 177 studies and only 263. So under a quarter of the articles even identified Asians as a distinct race ethnicity. So if you look at the paper that we even exist. Okay, so under a quarter, so about 24.4 percent. And of those papers, uh, approximately 10 percent of them actually reported any outcomes for Asian Americans with large, right? And uh, and then in terms of doing subgroups, it was only three and a quarter percent of those papers. So if you think about it, let's take, so a thousand papers, we're down to a quarter that actually have any results that even mention Asian Americans and only a 10th of those. So now we're talking about two and a half percent of all the papers that even have any outcomes for Asian Americans and even a smaller percentage of course, break out uh, subgroups uh, like the information that Dr. Sanivasan talked about. So this is not necessarily all these papers are they're going to secondary data sets for federal government. I mean, this is the researchers themselves not collecting the data and not reporting it. 
And as a, certainly as a physician and a former you know, academic physician, I don't know how many conferences I've gone to and I have paper after paper, abstract after abstract presented. And like, where are the Asian Americans? There's no results. And I challenged the presenters and they said, well, the numbers are too small. Then I said, then say that. We exist, mention us. If you have a problem, but but I'd also point out, and I think Dr. Sinavonson mentioned, you know, we're actually the third third largest racial ethnic group in California. Okay, so there's no excuse for anyone who's conducting research in California to not report results for Asian Americans. All right, there's no excuse. All right, if you can report for white, black, Latino, you can vote for Asian Americans. All right, there's enough of us. So that's something we have to stand up and demand. Uh, we have to demand that uh, if you apply for a grant at NIH, NIH should say that you will be reporting results on Asian Americans in your research or give us a good reason why you're not. You have to justify it. You cannot just simply not do it, right? Re journals, uh, the, the, those research journals who are publishing the papers, if the paper comes by and there's no outcomes for Asian Americans, that paper should be rejected unless they have a good rationale for why that wasn't. That needs to be the new standard for reporting. Because the problem is that if we're not mentioned, if we have no results, then we cannot make change. We cannot make policy. We do not get our issues addressed. We are erased. And that is a fundamental problem. Um, by the way, this is, of course, not just about medical research. Uh, certainly, that's one area. And it's very important. Federal government's actually uh, the Office of Management budgets moving through new regulations. It started in the Obama administration, stopped the Trump. It's restarting the Biden administration to, to require uh, collection across all racial ethnic groups, but particularly you know, Asian American subgroups, et cetera, align with the census. So that's a very important policy that's moving through that's going to ensure that we have uh, at least the data is collected. We have some challenges uh, getting to the data because of privacy issues. So that's important. But the other thing is, is that I also mentioned, so who makes these decisions? Right. So I'm going to again poke on medicine again because I'm a doctor and we're at Stanford Medicine's hosting this. Uh, so when we look at who's in the leadership of medicine, right, and we talk about Oh, well, if you look at medical school faculty over, you know, like 20% of academic faculty in the United States are Asian American. And then you go, oh, uh, let's look at who are, you know, who, who are the uh, full professors? Well, now you're down to 15%. Who are the department chairs? Now it's down to 11%. Who are the deans and vice deans? We actually, actually, as Asian Americans, we have the lowest number of deans and vice deans of any racial ethnic group. So we you get lumped in with not underrepresented, but we are the least represented, not just unrepresented, least represented of any racial ethnic group when it comes to the most senior leadership positions in medicine, in terms of academic medicine, the people who are like, you know, directing the research, you know, overseeing the institutions and so forth. And, um, and then the other thing I just also wanna mention in relation to that is, is that uh, at AP Data, uh, back in March, we did a survey with Mind of National Survey and again, really appreciate Pew doing their survey because there's so little research, you know, national data. So um, Asian Americans are the least likely to see others uh, like themselves in leadership by race, significantly less, all right? Only 26% would strongly agree with that statement compared to 43% of white, 42% of black, 40% uh, of Latinos, and also the least likely to have support to take on leadership opportunities at work by race. Again, only about a quarter, 26% see that of Asian Americans, 45% for white, 44% for Hispanic Latino, 43% for black. So we do not see ourselves in leadership. And actually, I just wanna wrap up with one final part. So there was a recent, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna pick on Kaiser Family Foundation. I love them, they do wonderful survey work. And there was a recent survey that came out on gun violence, right? And talk about the Allentown, actually, uh, I think of half the, you know, the lot, half of the people killed were Asian Americans. Um, so they came out of the study on concern about gun violence, national survey, right? And actually, if you look at the methodology, they say they collected data from, you know, the, from people distributed in race by according to the U.S. Census. And they reported on, you know, uh, Blacks and Latinos being very worried about gun violence, right? Very important stuff to come out, but not one word about Asian Americans in their report. And even in their methodology section, they never mentioned anything about Asian Americans, like why they didn't bother reporting on Asian Americans. Now, interesting enough, we actually have survey data from other surveys that show Asian Americans of all racial ethnic groups actually have the highest concern about gun violence. Yet the major story from this very important uh, research group 
which then hit all the national media, said, well, people, you know, Blacks and Latinos, and that's very important information, are most are con very concerned about uh, gun violence more so than whites, but not no mention of Asian Americans. We've been erased again. And that's the issue that we have to deal with. We have to demand that we're in the research, that the data is collected, and that our voices are heard and not simply erased over and over and over again. Dr. Fascinating, I guess my first question to you is, why are Asian Americans, why is the AAPI community so invisible? Well, I think, uh, well, for lots of reasons. We're not in the leader decision-making positions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we get lumped in with overrepresented. Actually, it's interesting that in many groups, so, uh, you know, uh, Buck G and Ascend, they've done things like in tech. And basically what you see is that people say, well, the model minority myth, right? Oh, you do fine. You know, you see number of white collar engineers, right? Uh, doctors, right? Faculty in medical schools, lawyers, et cetera, we're oh, quote, overrepresented in those professions. But when you look at who makes the decisions in those professions, journalism, by the way, right? So we, I had a, I held a hearing uh, of, uh, of the uh, Select Committee, Senate Select Committee on uh, Asian Pacific Islander Affairs uh, when I was in the state Senate. And we had people coming from journalism, law, entertainment, and tech uh, talking about, you know what? Uh, you look at the ground level and you see a lot of Asian Americans, you know, some people would argue overrepresented. And again, only some subgroups, because if you actually disaggregate, it turns out it does. And then when you as soon as you go up, uh, we disappear, right? As I, as I mentioned, in medicine, we go from being like the second, you know, quote, represented or even overrepresented, 20% of faculty, to being the least represented at the highest levels. We're not in the boardrooms, we're not in the CEO, we're not in the decisions. So what happens is that when people make decisions about resources, policies, even data collection, we're not there. And that has to change, right? And that's why, again, as chair of the API Legislative Caucus, our caucus included in the API equity budget, not only support for the very important support we need to give to people who are suffering from anti-Asian hate, but also investing in data and data equity that we need to have that data, not about Asian Americans overall, but also disaggregated, as I think Dr. Sandovanson showed. You know, there's so many differences between. And I know Dr. J uh, uh, Russell Jung is, you know, is part of API, uh, Stop API Hate. By the way, we're funding that because guess what? The government was not collecting that information. The reason we were able to raise the attention is because our own community collected the data. So in many ways, we have to demand that the data is collected. We also have to invest in ourselves in collecting the data because that's we couldn't have got the API equity budget if Stop API Hate hadn't on their own collected the data because there was no, you know, no one else is doing it. Uh, I, you know, there, I think you know, to recognize there's some other people within our own community like uh, Asian Advancing Justice, some others have also had some other, but outside of that, it wasn't like the government was systematically collecting data on hate incidents against Asian Americans. And Dr. Pan, this is a question from one of the attendees. How do we balance the push for increased visibility with the collection of disaggregated data while trying to prevent bias and stereotyping, you know, to the lack of represent, representation in leadership. So do you think there are any concerns about how our data, our voices will be handled and interpreted if we're not part of that process? So uh, I would say, first of all, of course, uh, don't be afraid of the data, right? Uh, the data will be the data. If there's good data, uh, that actually will only work to our advantage. Uh, and the other thing is, is that uh, we also need to be sure that we're part of the narrative in interpreting any data, right? And so uh, that is our community needs to stand out. Interesting enough, theoretically, uh, you know, people say, well, you know, we probably, we're, you know, the, the stereotype, we're good at math, and there's a lot of people, in, I mean, we have a lot of researchers in our community, right? I mean, we, we have the capacity to look at data, not, not doesn't apply to everybody, but, uh, you know, I, I think our community needs to work hard to be sure that data is collected, and then we also have a voice in the interpretation of that data. And then, of course, we're going to continue to work to be sure we're in the positions to uh, demand the resources, uh, to, to make the decisions when the data comes out, to be sure that our community is served, as well as other communities as well. You know, we have, we, ha we have common cause with so many other communities. This is not just about ourselves. I mean, the, the, this problem for our community also affects other communities as well. Mm -hmm. 
And I want to circle back to Neil. Neil, the, the Pew Research data is, is so amazing. I'm curious, what do you hope comes from that data? We talk about making policy and we need even the data to, to make policy. What is your hope for how this data will be used? Yeah, and I just hope that more that we provided a model for other researchers to also follow. Like what Dr. Pan just said, we knew going in, we couldn't even, we have only breaks for the six largest Asian origin groups. But before this, we did 66 focus groups of 18 different Asian origin groups in 18 different languages in a different study before the survey, because we knew that there's so much diversity. Um, that we knew that there was those living in poverty that that also needed a voice that we couldn't hear because aggregated data, even some of that disaggregated data, won't be able to elevate those voices. So I think, I think that's what's that's what's important from this model. For even though it's hard work, it's challenging. People say it's too expensive to do. Well, we can do it. So that's that's what I, I hope that others will do. And, and one of the things that uh, Dr. Pan you had talked about, you talked about there's no. Asian Americans in leadership roles to help push these policies, to help push this data. So I'm gonna ask everyone in this group, and I'll, I'll start with, with you, Dr. Pan. In the future, do you see a national leader, and some people have asked this question also in the, in the Q&A, do you ever see a national leader emerging and uniting the AAPI community? And if so, does that person exist today? Well, I, I don't think we should be looking for one single leader, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we need to work collectively together. Uh, we need to you know, work in partnership uh, with not only cross API you know, groups. I mean, we are a very diverse uh, umbrella. Actually, it goes back to the question about you know, Asian American, right? That was a construct that was created in the late 60s to build solidarity, because if we were all in our subgroups and we weren't working together, we would not have political power, right? We were uh, individually too small. We need to come together. And actually that's a challenge because I think as you presented in the beginning, right? Um, as we saw in the Pew data, right? I mean, you don't become Asian until you come to the United States, right? Where you know, the people, you know, so, uh, right? So this construct of Asian American is a, a construct that people have to learn when they come to this country, when they realize that, oh, Actually, if I'd, I'm not working in solidarity with others, uh, you know, with uh, other people, then we're not going to be able to get the things done. And so I think what we're really looking for is not so much a single leader, is we're looking for a collection of leaders uh, who will be working in solidarity to be sure that we get our priorities done. And, then, and we have to support each other, right? Uh, so we need to be sure that South Asians and Southeast Asians, and by the way, our Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders are always in a challenging position because they always feel like that they're outside, the, you know, they're, they're lumped in, but they're outside the orbit, right? We need to have them, you know, we all need to be supporting each other. And then, of course, even when we're all collectively helping each other, we need to recognize we also need to work in solidarity with our Black and Latino, uh, other LGBTQ, other groups, because even, even when we're all together, and even though we're growing, uh, we cannot do things alone. And so it, so we do need a collection of leaders who are all working to, to build that solidarity and then moving our community forward. And I'll pose that question to you, Dr. Sinri Vasan. I mean, what do you see in the medical field? Do you, do you see someone emerging or do, you, do we need, do we need a, a, a someone to, to, to champion the, the AAPI community's cause? But I, I don't know that we're going to have the emergence of someone who is like Martin Luther King, who galvanized uh, the African-American community to be able to uh, voice their concerns so clearly. Um, I, I think that what Dr. Pan is saying is what we're seeing is a plurality of good and allyship. That the challenge that a lot of um, uh, leaders who come from a specific cultural background, whether it's a religious background or a political background or a cultural background or a geographic one is balancing identity with uh, a personal identity with generality and being able to communicate messages that are universal while at the same time empowering the group that they're representing. And um, I think that we need to teach people how to do that. I think a large part of the reason we're not getting anywhere is because we haven't trained our people particularly well, either on how to be good allies so that you can reach um, across groups to be able to build coalitions uh, and also to be personally empowered to be able to speak your truth in an area uh, and a moment where it counts. 
Um, if you're in the room, a lot of people don't say what they need to say to be able to push um, uh, an equitable, uh, uh, just set of discussions forward when it comes to Asian health. Uh, they don't feel empowered. So part of what we need to do also is sort of normalize. We talk a lot about microaggression training, but we don't talk about uh, a group level or um, uh, individual level advocacy. And we need to teach people how to do those things. So no matter what level you're at, um, uh, everybody can make a difference. And, and Dr. Jung, during the whole Stop AAPI movement, were you surprised that there wasn't one emerging person that maybe unified the Asian American groups? And now like Dr. Penn and Dr. Srinivasan said, there's no one leader who could represent the breadth and diversity of our community. So I agree with them that we need um, a range of leaders. And that's what really buoyed me during the anti-Asian hate, um, the movement to stop it is that I saw so many new leaders emerge. And that's what we need is everybody in their location, in wherever they're working, wherever they're going to school, to, to step up and to lead our community. So I thought that's what was good is that we didn't just have an individual leader, but we had a huge movement um, rise up. And Neil, I'll, I'll, I'll let you have the last word on, on this question. And it was kind of your question. You had brought it up in, the, in our discussions last week. Uh, so not to put you on the spot, but do you see a, a need or a calling for uh, the community asking for someone to step up? I think I align with my fellow um, panelists. I mean, when we did the 66 focus groups, we asked this, can they even identify a leader? And a lot of people had a hard time. But people were mentioning their local leaders, people who were closer to them. So I think that that's what it is. There's a plurality. Like maybe there is going to be a national leader emerging in the future. We don't know if, if someone's going to be a presidential candidate again. Or, or um, But I think that, but usually I think there's going to be a plurality. Well, thank you very much for everyone for joining us. I know we're, we're starting to go over our time. And this, this subject is so complex and complicated and we we spent an hour talking about it i feel like we only we only scratched the surface on this issue um but i do want to thank everyone for for joining us um a big thank you for everyone that's tuning in asking questions i'm sorry i couldn't get to everyone's questions a big thank you to stanford cares for hosting this event for aapi heritage month what does it mean to be Asian, Amer Asian in America for missing data and misrepresentations? A uh, big thank you to our panel of experts, Neil Ruiz, uh, Dr. Russell Jung, Dr. Malpia Srinivasan, Dr. Richard Pan. Also thank you to some of our sponsors, all of our sponsors, including the Asian American Journalists Association. Uh, Nina Lee, thank you very much for taking the time to organize and, and bring us all together. It, it's amazing. Uh, we do want to mention this panel discussion will be posted on Stanford Care's YouTube page. So if you want to go back and listen. Uh, also, I notice uh, some of the panelists have been answering the questions in the Q&A directly, uh, some of them that we didn't, weren't able to get to. So uh, please look for some answers there. But uh, thank you again for, for, for hosting this discussion and, and including all of us in this. Um, once again, my name is Ryan Yamamoto with KPIX. We're, we're all month long. I, I'm going to do a shameless plug for my station. Uh, all month long, we've been featuring stories on the AAPI community, and, and we will have a one-hour special airing Friday, May 26th at 4 p.m., uh, along with myself and KPIX reporter Betty Yu. But uh, thank you for every month, everybody with your contributions, your expertise. Um, I wish we could talk a couple more hours, but, but we have to move on with our day. But thank you very much for everyone joining us, and, and hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thank you.